let me uh, share my screen and I'll do a little bit of introduction and then we'll begin with uh, the topic for today, which uh, of course, as you do by now, is the uh, great flu pandemic of 1918. Uh, so we'll get up uh, to where we should be. Uh, here we are. And uh, I would like to remind everybody that uh, this is uh, an official event of the Somerville Museum. And if you possibly can in these very difficult times, uh, maybe you could perhaps uh, see your way clear to helping the museum out, maybe giving a contribution if you're able to the emergency fund of the museum. It's uh, a very treasured institution uh, here in Somerville. And uh, like many cultural institutions, it's uh, run into a rough spot. Uh, and if uh, at all possible, uh, maybe you could help this wonderful institution out. Uh, so there's the uh, website there on the left, as far as the GoFundMe is concerned. And if uh, you want to see a little bit more of that, uh, then you can certainly look in the chat room as well. So uh, with that as an introduction, my name is Daniel Breen, and I'm broadcasting to you from Spring Hill and Somerville, where we've had a bit of a windy day. Things are a bit blustery. And sometimes here, when things are a bit blustery, uh, it may be a little bit difficult uh, for my uh, sound to come out very well. Uh, but with any luck, uh, it won't be too bad. And I'll try to talk maybe a bit more slowly than I usually do, uh, just so you can keep up with me just a little bit better. So uh, let's begin in earnest uh, with a topic for today, the uh, flu pandemic of 1918. And what I'd like to do especially is talk about the way that epidemic, uh, grievous as it was, uh, particularly affected uh, Boston and Somerville. But in order to begin, we can't begin with our community here in Middlesex County. We've got to begin at what we think is probably the beginning, uh, and that is actually an entirely different part of the world, a world that is of special significance to at least one member of our audience, and that is Kansas. Nobody really knows precisely with 100% certainty uh, where the great flu pandemic of 1918 began. But the leading theory is that it probably began in southwestern Kansas in Haskell County, a tiny county with maybe a few thousand people, uh, probably a little bit bigger back then than it is now, but still uh, very, very small. And during January of 1918, the county doctor, the one who made most of the house calls in the county, a guy named Dr. Minor, began to notice the higher than usual level of flu cases. They weren't all that serious, but they were a bit more serious than the flu usually was. And that got him alarmed, alarmed enough to report this to the state health authorities. And by February of 1918, he was getting alarmed indeed. But it may well have been that this outbreak in Haskell County may have just stuck around rural Kansas. And that might've been true if times were normal, but this was 1918 and times are anything but normal. If you were drafted in Haskell County or anywhere in the neighborhood, they were gonna send you to training camp in 1918 to go eventually overseas and fight in the First World War. And the place where you would go uh, if you lived in Haskell County or indeed most of Kansas uh, was gonna be Fort Riley uh, and especially Camp Funston, which was the training camp outside of Fort Riley. And we think what happened was that people ill with the flu from Haskell County in that part of Kansas drafted, then went to Camp Funston, which was an enormous training camp. In World War I, they uh, ultimately built 16 major training camps uh, all across the country, probably the greatest single construction endeavor of the United States uh, before the Second World War. And one of the biggest was Camp Funston. Uh, you had 1,400 buildings at Camp Funston, uh, and you would room them out if need be or maybe 40,000 troops passing through, many of them training, uh, I think, for the 89th Division for service in France. In March of 1918, March 4th, as a matter of fact, somebody fell ill in Camp Funston, and his name was uh, Albert Gaskell, and he reported as a cook to the doctor, or one of them at Camp Funston, with a 104-degree fever. Alarming symptoms, indeed. Within a few days, uh, dozens, then hundreds of soldiers training at Camp Funston were sick, and the only thing to do about that was to build a special entity's barracks for them where the sick could be placed in the hope that they might get better. Uh, and here's what it looked like at Camp Funston uh, by the beginning of March, 1918. It was not a subject of terrible alarm even then though, because many of these guys got better uh, within two or three days. They began calling it, as a matter of fact, the three day flu, but some didn't get better. There were fatalities, and some concern. But again, 
nothing that people made such a big deal out. But this was the first major outbreak in what would become the pandemic of 1918, which would ultimately kill over 50 million people all over the world. Here it is right at Camp Funston. And it would affect, as we'll see, uh, Boston pretty quickly, but uh, not right away. Uh, the aspect of Boston life that was affected right away had to do with this man right here. That, of course, is George Herman Babe Ruth. After people began to be ill at Camp Funston, things being the way they were, they were often transported to the East, eventually to take ship for France. And they had to take ship quickly because after all, uh, this was March of 1918 and the great German offensives had begun by March of 1918. And it was vital that American servicemen get overseas quickly. So men from Camp Funston, whether they had symptoms or not, began to be transported East. And some of them arrived at Camp Pike in Arkansas, uh, right outside of Hot Springs. And they arrived at Camp Pike just at the time in March of 1918 that the Boston Red Sox were playing an exhibition right outside of Hot Springs. And although it rained really hard and they couldn't get the game in, Babe Ruth, who you see here, was able to hit five home runs during a special batting practice they gave. But the significant thing about that for us is that at some point that spring, maybe because of exposure to ill soldiers at Camp Pike, Babe Ruth got sick with the flu. And in his case, it was a pretty serious case. Uh, he ultimately had such a sore throat from the flu that they had to coat his throat with silver nitrate, which doesn't sound like a good idea, silver nitrate, but that's what they did. It was a common remedy back then. And unfortunately, uh, maybe a bit too much got at his throat and below. And as a consequence, Babe Ruth got uh, very sick, not just with the flu, but from the remedy. They actually had to take him to a hospital in Boston and soak his, uh, or cake his throat in ice to try to do something about that. But uh, luckily he recovered. And as we'll see, the Red Sox went on to win the pennant that year. Well, what was this flu? What was this disease uh, that began to afflict people uh, in uh, March of 1918? Uh, although uh, not too seriously, at, at least not yet. And uh, we have an advantage over people back then. We know what this was. Uh, what this was, uh, was an influenza variety caused by a virus, and it happened to be a type A H1N1 virus, very similar to what we've been used to in past years. The origin of this has been hotly debated. Everything about the pandemic of 1918 has been hotly debated. And this is one thing that people argue about a lot. What was the ultimate derivation of this influenza that was making people sick in the US by the spring of 1918? And it seems to have been avian in origin, probably from birds, although it could have passed through pigs on the way to human beings. But it certainly did, or at least we're pretty sure, uh, that it had some bird origin. And that would not have been unlikely for Haskell County. You got about a, a lot of chickens there, and it's a famous place for migratory birds to go back and forth. So that could well be uh, what, what actually happened. That's probably where, where it was from. Now, they didn't know anything about that then. What they thought back then was that the flu, influenza, was probably caused by a germ, a bacillus. And they even had a name for it, uh, the Pfeiffer's bacillus, that people spent many hundreds, many thousands of hours trying to find a way to address, try to find a way to eradicate, find a vaccine for it. But they were looking for the wrong thing. It wasn't a bacillus at all that caused the flu. It was this virus, the H1N1. And in 1918, they had an idea that viruses existed, but nobody had ever seen one. So they had no way of knowing that the culprit here and the thing that would make this influenza so dangerous were eight genes on that virus, three of which would especially strike the bronchial tubes of the lungs. And they would strike the bronchial passages with such force that if you had a bad case of the flu, chances were it would lead to pneumonia. And if it led to pneumonia, uh, fatality was much more common. In fact, if you died of the flu, uh, often what you really died from was influenza. So this was uh, nothing to be taken lightly but they didn't know quite how bad it was because they didn't know what it was. And as far as treating this, they had no antibiotics, of course. So the usual way to treat the flu, uh, not unexpectedly, was a bed rest uh, and try to perhaps hope that nature will take its course and you'd get better. But as of that spring of 1918, uh, into the late spring, 
uh, there wasn't, as I said, a whole lot of worry about this. The troops moved east, they moved towards the uh, ports, and uh, 89,000 of them, many of whom might have been exposed to the flu, took ship in March for Europe, and another 110,000 took ship in April, many of whom would be fed into the meat grinder of the Western Front, especially in the great autumn offensives uh, that were about to ensue. But again, uh, not a whole lot of worry. But all that was about to change, and for reasons nobody could predict. Uh, the difficulty was this. In the typical case of the flu, if you had a very serious case, uh, you really felt bad, and uh, you really were in no condition to go to work, of course you'd stay home. The serious cases stay home and hope for the best. We had known about the flu since the days of Hippocrates. This went back over 2,000 years, and, and that's ultimately what people would do. Uh, if you had a mild case of the flu, then you would, if you could, go about your business. Maybe you couldn't take time off from work. Maybe it was important to you to be out and about. So the mild cases would be out in society. And because the mild cases customarily would be out in society, it would be the mild strain that would spread around and that wouldn't be that serious. The really serious cases where you couldn't move, those are the ones who stayed at home. But as soon as the flu crossed the Atlantic, and as soon as this Camp uh, Funston Haskell County flu ended up in France in the trenches where the doughboys went, that custom, that dynamic reversed. If you were really, really sick, they took you away from your new home, that is the trenches. If you had a mild case, they left you where you were. They needed you there. These aren't American soldiers on the screen, but you get the point. Uh, so the, the mild cases stay there, but the very serious cases, they go to the rear areas. And what that means is it's the serious cases that spread. Whatever mutation that would be, that's gonna go all around the rear areas. So by the summer of 1918, not only did you have a pandemic in Europe, it was a very serious one with a much more virulent strain of the flu than had afflicted Americans back in the spring. It spread all around France. And from France, uh, it spread into the German lines and then into centuries. It spread south into Spain. And because it was prevalent in Spain, we often hear this called the Spanish flu. But it's important to remember that it had nothing to do with origins in Spain. The reason they called it the Spanish flu was that the Spaniards had been sensible enough to stay out of World War I. So in Spain, there was a free press. People reported on the flu and how bad it was. Thousands of cases, about 10,000 deaths uh, in September of 1918 of the flu in Spain. And you could read about that in the newspapers in Spain. And so they called it the Spanish flu because if you read the newspapers in England or France or Germany or any of the other combatant countries, the news was heavily censored. They didn't want civilians panicking over this. So they kept quiet the extent of this crisis. And it has ever afterward because of the honesty of the Spaniards been known as the Spanish flu. Of course, it's uh, useful to point out that the Spanish themselves didn't call this the Spanish flu. They called it the French flu. The Germans called it the Flanders flu, as a matter of fact, uh, but the name the Spanish flu has stuck. So uh, as of uh, the summer of 1918, uh, it was spreading and it was spreading seriously. Franz Kafka got a case of the flu. Uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, the man who gave us the term surrealism, got a case of the flu. David Lord George, uh, David Lord George, Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, he came down with the flu as well, uh, along with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and later millions of others. Uh, but one of the more famous cases uh, is this man here, uh, Edvard Munch, the great Norwegian artist, uh, also came down with the flu. Uh, and he gave us, as a lasting testament to his experience, this self-portrait uh, self portrait with the Spanish flu by Edvard Munch. So now it is a phenomenon in Western Europe. And little by little, if you lived in the United States, you could pick up the newspaper and you could read snippets of reports of this flu, just a bit here and there. Cases from Spain and uh, a few words would leak out from Britain and, and France and, and Ireland too, for that matter. But mostly what they talked about was the effect of the flu on the German army. There was a lot of wishful thinking. 
This will drive the Germans out of the war. The Kaiser has the flu, which in fact he did. He did for a while have a case of the flu. So that's what you read about, but you didn't read about the seriousness of this crisis. This was a much more serious kind of flu that was now spreading all over Western Europe. Uh, the only way you heard about it uh, was if you happened to turn to page seven or page eight of the newspaper, and there was just a little bit about it, but, but that's about all. People were interested, of course, in the great offensives of the spring of summer, 1918. And they were interested in Eugene Debs' trial for violating the Sedition Act, which was also going on. Those were on the front pages, but nothing about this flu. So the stage was set for what would prove to be an unfortunate and disastrous surprise. How did the flu recross the ocean and afflict the United States? And that's the story that has to do with Boston. Next time you're down at the seaport, uh, walking around uh, and enjoying Boston's newest neighborhood, make sure you spend a little bit of time at Commonwealth Pier, because that is historic ground. One morning, August 27th, 1918, a ship containing uh, a good number of sailors who had recently been docked in Plymouth in England, docked at the Commonwealth Pier, South Boston, as it was always known back then. And when you, you docked at the pier, what they would often do, because sailors need places to stay, is put them up on what amounted to a floating barracks right by Commonwealth Pier, and they called it the receiving ship. And it soon hundreds of these sailors were living at the receiving ship, the first batch having arrived with cases of the flu on August 27, 1918. Just a few cases then, but anybody around the receiving ship soon noticed that the cases began to rise and they rose quickly. A couple dozen by August 28th, a hundred by the end of August, August 31st. So this was a serious situation indeed. Now you had an outbreak of the flu, not the relatively mild form, but the mutated virulent form. And it began to lay people up in seriously ill and unable to function, unable to move. And what the Navy now had to do in Boston Harbor was at all costs contain this, contain this to the harbor, make sure it doesn't spread anymore, as catastrophic as this might be. So what they did was they took all the cases they could off the receiving ship, and some of them went to Chelsea Har uh, Hospital, Chelsea Naval Hospital at the uh, northern part of Boston Harbor. Some of them went to Long Island, the old Boston Pest House on Long Island in Boston Harbor, but there was no room for all of them first. And news began to leak out into the Boston press that these cases were uh, afflicting sailors in Boston Harbor. But the naval doctors were determined not to create alarm. What you would have read in the newspaper is naval doctors officially quoted as saying it's nothing serious, it's just the usual flu. They called it the grip, uh, just the usual grip. But what it was, was anything but unusual. You had men with 103, 104 degree fevers, coughing uncontrollably. You had discolored faces, uh, blue with purplish blotches. We used to call it the, the blue death, as a matter of fact, because of that. And also you had men dying and dying relatively quickly. What you had, in other words, on your hands was a public health emergency. And you had authorities, especially with the Navy, doing what they could to downplay the seriousness of it. But that in itself may not have been their biggest mistake. Probably their biggest mistake was they allowed sailors from the receiving ship who had been exposed to the virus, although they didn't know it was a virus then, they allowed 1,000 sailors from the harbor to march in a special parade through downtown Boston uh, called, as a matter of fact, the Win the War for Freedom Parade. They went all through the downtown area and one can't help but believe in that parade, the affliction of civilians had much of its most important roots. If you were anywhere along the route, I uh, think how likely it might be now that you could be afflicted with the flu. On September 3rd, you had the first civilian case. That's September 3rd. But still, nothing much in the newspapers. Everybody was assured there was nothing much to worry about. And then, by September 3rd, 
uh, if you looked out in the harbor, if you had a free pass, if you could actually see what was going on, you would see from one end of the harbor about 2,000 cases, so many cases that some of them had to be sent to city hospital in the south end, uh, which we'll get back to uh, in a second. But many of these cases uh, were actually sent not to city hospital because of the overflow from facilities in the harbor, but actually to Quarry Hill in Brookline. And many of you will know Quarry Hill if you take Summit Avenue from Commonwealth Avenue to uh, Beacon Street, uh, you go right past one of the highest eminences in Boston. That's Quarry Hill, scene of the Brooks Hospital back then. And the Navy had the idea, and it wasn't a bad one, to build a special tent city on Quarry Hill for people sick with the flu, young men sick with the flu. And as you can see here in the slide, uh, it really was a tent city. On uh, September 7th, 1918, they sent three, uh, several hundred members of the National Guard from Brookline up Quarry Hill. In record time, they put up 200 tents and the flu victims began to crowd in and outside of the tents, but especially outside, as you can see, because the idea was that maybe it would do these guys some good to be outside in fresh air. The cases were serious. It didn't seem to be doing them much good to be inside, what about outside? Sunlight, fresh air, maybe that would work. And in fact, we think it might have done some good because the death rate among uh, naval personnel in this outbreak in the summer of 1918 was actually less on Quarry Hill than it was elsewhere. And that idea of having people outside to try to recover would spread to the Medfield Asylum, home of the movie Shutter Island, just south of Boston, it would also spread to Lawrence, and there's some reason to think uh, there was something to this theory. Uh, however, you might notice in the picture uh, that we have a, a nurse wearing a mask not terribly well or terribly effectively, serving as maybe a bad example in this case. But as we'll see, a, a mask would begin to be worn pretty soon, and nurses would, as they are still doing today, give us an outstanding example of, of heroism in the face of, of great obstacles. But we're still in the first week of September. And if you picked up the newspaper, now it's September 7th, September 8th, there's a few civilian cases around. Still what you read was there was nothing much to worry about. So here is a, a sample from September 6th from the Globe, from the, the uh, head of uh, naval doctors uh, in the harbor. This malady is just the old fashioned grip. The daily list of cases is diminishing. Well, it wasn't diminishing. It was only getting worse, but that's what you read in the paper. The daily list of cases is diminishing. And the mayor of Boston, a guy named Peters, the chairman of the uh, Commission of Public Health, his name was Woodward, they saw no reason for alarm, uh, nor did much alarm come from the governor. Uh, they're just adopting a wait and see posture here. And uh, as it turned out, there were other things to worry about. Not just the fact that the United States Army was engaged in the great San Mihal Offensive, uh, at this point in getting ready for the greatest battle in all American history, the murders argonne Offensive, in the last week of September, there was also the fact, after all, that the Red Sox uh, were in the World Series. Uh, they played the Chicago Cubs in the 1918 World Series. And as a matter of fact, they won that series in six games. They had to play the World Series in early September. They had to get it done by September 15th, because on September 15th, the United States government was putting into effect a work or fight order. So you had to work at something useful or you had to be in the military in some capacity if you were a male of a certain age. And baseball did not count as a war industry. So the thing to do was get the World Series done by the middle of September. And that's what they did. Uh, the World Series ended on September 11th with the Red Sox winning two to one. The interesting thing about that final game, though, they played it in Fenway Park, is that there were only about 15,000 fans at the game, which leads one to conclude that no matter what the papers were saying, people were starting to get worried about this. People could see around them uh, neighbors, people they knew getting sick, and they didn't want to take the risk of being in a place like a crowd at Fenway Park. So at any rate, here we are now, so far in the story, with the middle of September, the cases, the civilian cases, were beginning to rise. And it was clear to anybody who paid attention that this strain of the flu 
was nothing like that earlier strain, the first wave. This was serious, uh, and the death rate was higher. At that point, our uh, scene uh, shifts to uh, Boston City Hospital that uh, was showing the first signs of something getting out of hand. Uh, all the beds were filled at the city hospital by the middle of September. And in addition to that, you had about 170 members of the MBTA, that is conductors, uh, engineers on our city subway system who were out with the flu uh, by the middle of September. It was becoming more difficult to get uh, a train because of this. And you also had hundreds of telephone operators out with the flu. The cases, in other words, were beginning to get out of hand, but still no official word, no official action. Uh, but that would change a little bit in our own community of Somerville. By the middle of September, there was a big debate going on in Boston about closing the schools. Maybe the time had come to close the schools. Woodward, however, the public health commissioner in Boston, did not want to do that. Didn't want to sow too much concern in the civilian population. And anyway, if you close the schools, the reason reasoning was, well, there are nurses in the schools, and if the kids get sick, at least there'll be a nurse there. But that was becoming more and more untrue by the middle of September. Nurses were needed at City Hospital and other places like that. But nevertheless, the Boston schools stayed open. But in Somerville, uh, we had a city doctor, a guy named Dr. Tolles, who could see for himself that things were getting extremely serious. You had 800 students in the Somerville schools down with the flu, 800 students. And probably the worst of it uh, happened right here. Uh, and this is actually uh, now Morse Park, which is right down the street from where I am now. And there was an elementary school back then in 1918 at Morse Park. And in uh, the, the, the summer of that year, uh, September, uh, you had literally out of 400 students at the Morse Park School, uh, 75 to 80 down with the flu, which was unsustainable. Uh, that's gonna mean more and more are sick. But not only did you have uh, nearly 100 students at one school down with the flu, but four out of the teachers uh, were down with the flu. And what that meant was, according to Towles, uh, we've got no choice, we gotta close the schools. So as of September 17th, I think, uh, the schools of Somerville were closed. And that's a full week before schools closed in, in Boston. So leaving Somerville for a second, the scene now shifts, uh, still in the middle of September uh, 1918, uh, to a place that was on a lot of people's minds, and that was Camp Devons. Camp Devons was one of these well-known training camps uh, in World War I, and it was one of the biggest ones, uh, just up Route 2 uh, from the city of Boston. And it was there by September 8th that young men began to get sick. Not surprisingly, there was bound to be a lot of coming and going between the port and Camp Devons. And if you were there in the third week of September, what you were faced with was a genuine emergency. You had uh, about a thousand kids getting sick uh, by over the course of two or three days at a time. Eventually, 760 soldiers would die at Camp Devons. Ultimately, 14,000 soldiers would get sick with the flu at Camp Devons. And at the height of this, the third week of September, getting into the fourth week, at the height of it, it was so bad that a hospital built for 1,200 soldiers had to accommodate 6,000, which meant there was no way they could do it. They had to be put in special barracks uh, where the facilities were not that good. And if you went to Camp Devons, you would see bodies stacked up like cordwood outside the infirmary. A shortage of coffins meant all they could do was stack up the bodies. Doctors on their way to autopsies had to step over the bodies at Camp Devons to get to where they needed to go. And there was absolutely nothing as far as they knew that could be done about this but to wait and hope for the best. Uh, the situation did not get any better anytime soon, uh, but at least they got a handle to some extent upon the real problem here, as we'll see. And the real problem and the thing that struck everybody was the mortality rate among the young. And we'll get back to that in a second. But this is a, a, a typical bed at Camp Devons. And uh, in this slide, the next one, 
we'll see uh, one of the wards at Camp Devins towards the end of this pandemic, as it struck Camp Devins, one of the worst places to be uh, in, in the entire pandemic. Unfortunately, we're talking now about Eastern Massachusetts. Unfortunately, many soldiers from Camp Devins, uh, if they didn't seem to be showing much of the way of symptoms, uh, would be taken to get some more training at Camp Upton on Long Island. And that's one of the ways the flu spread from Massachusetts by uh, late September to Long Island, New York, and Point South. There were all sorts of ways it spread by railroad, by sea, but this is one of them. And it is lucky for us that this guy had left Camp Upton by the time the flu arrived. That, of course, is Irving Berlin. And a lot of people didn't like military service for obvious reasons, but Irving Berlin hated military service. He hated everything about the barracks. And when he got there, all he could think about was his lovely New York apartment where he had servants and where he'd get a, a nice sandwich at three o'clock in the morning without asking anybody. He hated it there. And that's why he wrote the great anthem of all people who ever been in uniform, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, written at Camp Upton before the flu arrived. Irving Berlin might have been there for the flu, but the army had the good sense to know that he wasn't terribly useful to them as a doughboy. So they let him stay in Manhattan, ultimately, where he would eventually give us God Bless America. Uh, that those years, 1917, 1918. Now, getting back to the Boston area, uh, now in our story, where up until the third week of September, and now anybody, anybody, anybody could see that the flu was ravaging the civilian population. It was getting much worse. And so finally, uh, what they decided they had to do uh, is not delay any further, as we'll see. Uh, they decided to begin to close the schools and to begin to close the theaters. But while we're on the topic of the flu striking men of military age and especially hurting them, it's worthwhile asking why that would be. Because the interesting thing about the 1918 flu pandemic was that the affliction rate and the mortality rate as well kind of look like a W. They often talk about it as a, a W kind of epidemic. So there was a high rate of illness and mortality if you were very young. And then among adolescents, not so bad. But if you were in your late teens or 20s, that was a high rate of mortality. And then it would sink down for people who were middle-aged, not so bad. And then a different high level if you were, you were, you were quite elderly. In fact, in Boston, in the South End, there was a 112-year-old woman who died of the flu. That's really, really high up on the other end of the W. So why would it be that so many men of military age, strong, healthy, will pass away from the flu once they got the flu? The mortality rate among them was twice what it was among other demographics. And there's a couple answers for that, a couple of theories, and I wanted to share them with you. One theory I don't like, and one theory I do like. Now, the theory I don't like is that if you're young, you tend to have a strong immune system. And maybe this flu, this strain, this mutated strain of the flu was so powerful, so dangerous, that it triggered an overwhelming immunological response among young bodies who could actually trigger such a response, the immune system being what it was in those bodies. And as a result, did more harm than good, actually overwhelmed the body and maybe contributed to mortality. So that is uh, one theory, uh, and we often hear that. It's called a cytokine explosion. I might have mispronounced that. Uh, I, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I play one on Zoom, but I'm not an epidemiologist. Can't even pronounce it. Uh, but it was a cytokine explosion. So that's one theory, uh, an overwhelming immunological response. The other theory, and this is the one I like, has to do with a prior flu epidemic. And that was the flu epidemic of 1888, and especially 1889. And that killed over a million people all around the world. And it struck the United States after origins, we think, in, in Russia, or maybe what is now Uzbekistan. But it eventually struck the United States. And the first American case was actually a guy from Canton, just down the road from where we are now in Somerville. But the reason I like this theory is some believe that if you got the flu in 1889 or the variety the next year, which was very much related to it, 
then it might be that you had enough antibodies left over to fight off this new infection of 1918. So if you were 40, uh, you were in luck. Uh, maybe you were able to fight off the infection back then, and maybe times were not so bad for you in 1918. But if you were 18 or 19 or 20, you weren't alive in 1889, and that might be why perhaps you would be having a more difficult time. Uh, but the reason I like that theory has nothing to do with La Petite Parisienne, which you just saw. It really has to do with the most, one of the most famous of contracts cases of all time. And I teach things like contract law, so I really like this kind of stuff. Back in, uh, as you can see here, back in uh, uh, 1890, I think, with the danger of the flu on a lot of people's minds, one company decided it would be a bright idea to make and market what was called the carbolic smoke ball. Many of you attorneys are now having bad memories of law school, perhaps. But the idea of the carbolic smoke ball was you could buy this thing and breathe in the carbolic smoke from the carbolic smoke ball, and that would mean you wouldn't get the flu, or if you did have the flu, you would feel better. And as you can see in the ad, they said, if you actually buy and use the carbolic smoke ball, and you get the flu, despite using the carbolic smoke ball, we will award you a hundred pounds and we got the money on account. Well, you know the rest of the story, I'll bet. A uh, woman uh, buys the carbolic smoke ball, breathes in the carbolic smoke ball smoke, eventually gets the flu, recovers, and she goes down to Prince's Street in Hanover Square, and she asks for her 100 pounds. That's what the ad said. And the carbolic smoke ball people said, no, we're not gonna give you 100 pounds. It's just an ad. You can't take it seriously. Who pays attention to ads anyway? Well, the judge agreed with the woman who got sick. And the doctrine forevermore has been an advertisement is usually not an offer. It's usually not a contract at all. It's just an advertisement. But if it's really specific, if they tell you, if you do this, we'll give you that. And they're very specific about what they'll do. An advertisement can be an offer. You can accept it by buying the carbolic smoke ball. And if you get the flu, you get a recovery. It's a breach of contract. And that has been the law ever since the 1890s. And that's why I like that second theory about mortality among people who were in their 20s uh, and maybe early 30s. But we are still in, in our story uh, as of the third to fourth week in September uh, and back to Boston now, because uh, if anybody uh, was going to do something about this flu, it had to be done now. Uh, Truth to tell, what they probably should have done, and you've been thinking about this to yourself probably all along, was close the schools, close public amusements, anything like that, much earlier than they did. But again, they didn't. Uh, they downplayed the danger, and it was only they couldn't ignore it anymore that under pressure from Governor McCall, Health Commissioner Woodward, and Mayor Peters finally announced September 25th, that the schools of Boston would be closed. A week after Somerville, uh, the schools of Boston would be closed. And not only the schools, but also the theaters, as we'll see. Uh, that's, I think, uh, uh, that's the, the old opera house uh, in downtown Boston, that was closed. Uh, the theaters, saloons, cafes, all public gatherings were discouraged and much of public life began to slow down considerably in the face of this epidemic. To, top, to stop the spread, they finally acted, but it took them over three weeks to do so. And in the meantime, uh, in addition to this, people began to be advised uh, to stay home if they could, to wear a mask, as we'll see. Uh, here's a Boston nurse uh, with a mask on. And during the midst of the crisis, as people began being worried and more and more worried about catching the flu, the uh, real heroes began to emerge and they certainly were the nurses. There was a shortage of nurses all over the country in 1918 as this influenza spread from place to place, uh, place to place, all through the East Coast, into the Midwest, into the South. Nurses were at a premium because of course the war was on, the war was on its worst stage over in Europe from the American point of view. Nurses were needed over there, so there were a few of them over here. So what the nurses did uh, was they went above and beyond the call of duty because they had to. They made, according to one estimate, 
about 6,000 different house calls all over Boston to check in on people who were sick or too sick to get to an overcrowded hospital. They used Red Cross ambulances to do that. When there were no ambulances, when there were no official cars, some people in Boston volunteered their own cars so that nurses at great personal risk to themselves could get to the places where they needed to go to check on those who were within. Uh, and while the uh, orders were in effect, uh, closing the saloons, as I said, and uh, also the cafes and the theaters, uh, the nurses and the doctors had a real difficulty, a real quandary. How do we actually treat those who are ill? And there are several different remedies in effect, uh, not all of them very uh, good or very likely. Uh, sometimes people were told to uh, wrap a bit of camphor around their neck, and that would be the operative ingredient uh, Vicks Vapor Rub eventually. Sometimes they were told to uh, just to maybe wear a little, little garlic, uh, and that was common in some immigrant communities, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but what doctors often did was they would prescribe the only thing they could think to prescribe, and that was aspirin. There's no antibiotics. Why not prescribe aspirin to deal at least with some of the symptoms of this flu? Uh, there are now thousands of cases in Boston, and by early October, about 3,000 were dead in Boston. Something had to be done. So aspirin was often the thing they prescribed. Maybe it would do some good. And there was a good thing and a bad thing about that. The good thing was that their aspirin, the first mass-produced aspirin uh, to hit the general market, their patent actually ran out in 1917. So with the patent out, aspirin was now cheaper and you could prescribe it to more people. That was the good thing. The bad thing was physicians went overboard often with these prescriptions. And sometimes what they would do is prescribe aspirin to the amount of 30 grams a day to people who were sick. And we know that 30 grams a day is an awful lot of aspirin. That can be toxic, that amount of aspirin. That's seven times the amount of aspirin you might be taking today uh, if you had something that required aspirin. But they didn't know too much about the effects of that kind of aspirin by then. And so we think that some of the high fatality rate, some of the high fatality rate of this second wave of the pandemic had to do with a great deal of aspirin prescriptions. Meanwhile, by the late Last week in September, early October, uh, Boston was a desolate place indeed. And I wanna give you uh, one quote from a nurse who spent a lot of time going from place to place in Boston, caring for those uh, that she could see. Uh, according to this nurse, uh, Boston was almost like a rural village. Uh, there was death in the streets in the form of funeral processions. There was death at home in the form of family members lost forever. It was a sad time and a catastrophic time. And nobody came out well from this. There were no winners uh, in this epidemic. Uh, but at least, as I said, we have heroes. In, and I think those were the nurses and medical personnel. Here in Somerville, uh, the virulence was particularly bad. Uh, we lost 200, about 250 people in three weeks in Somerville. Cambridge lost almost 700. Uh, we lost about 250. And it was so bad in Somerville that some policemen would not go into homes if there were sick people there, fearing about catching the contagion. So what happened in Somerville was actually that women's clubs in Somerville, uh, where nurses weren't available, women's clubs organized themselves to cook meals. And if they were healthy, they would take meals to houses where people, sometimes entire families, were so sick that nobody could actually do the cooking and they fed people at grievous personal risk to them. So not just the nurses, but also women's clubs in places like Somerville took up some of the slack and stepped up to do their duty when it was very difficult to do so. Now here you see nurses at Camp Devens and what they're doing is making masks. Uh, people were advised to wear masks, but uh, there was no order to wear masks, but people were advised to do so. Woodward, the uh, health commissioner uh, in Boston, uh, never issued such an order, but it was considered an advisable thing to do. The masks tend to be made of gauze, so I'm not sure they were uh, all that good. And here are some nurses putting some together. But the real problem with the mask was if you were so addicted to smoking that you insisted on putting a hole in the mask so your cigarette could be there, then 
uh, of course, it wasn't going to do any good at all. And there's an awful lot of stories about people with holes in the masks because they insisted on smoking no matter what. So here we are, finally, in the first week in October, and uh, things are about as bad as they can be. Uh, as I said, there's no winners from this entire story, except maybe, ultimately, Kleenex. Kleenex was a product that was first branded as a way for women to remove cosmetics, makeup. And that's what they thought they would sell it as. But with the pandemic and its aftermath, Kleenex soon found that the most effective way to market it would be as a treatment for people who were ill and didn't want to spread germs or maybe contract germs from others. So you wanted to uh, have a handkerchief, perhaps. Many people had handkerchiefs during the pandemic. But if you didn't have a, a real handkerchief and if something was really dirty, then Kleenex was the next best thing. And ever after, that's often how they would market Kleenex. Uh, the great flu pandemic had a big role in that. Meanwhile, uh, other aspects of Boston and Somerville life did have to change during these three weeks of what amounted to their version of a lockdown. Uh, among other things, they had to cancel sports around Boston, just as we've done now during the COVID-19 crisis. One of the most popular things to do in Boston was to go to high school football games. They were much more popular then than they are now. And there was a suburban league, uh, Everett, Somerville, Malden, Melrose, all those high schools would play uh, in the suburban league and everybody would go to the games, but they're not gonna be able to do that now. So suburban league games were canceled, even though Somerville was the favorite to win the suburban league in 1918, uh, they canceled the league, uh, they canceled the games and maybe Somerville wouldn't have done that well anyway, because among the many people to sicken in Somerville was the Somerville High School football coach. He came down with a bad case of the flu, and it took him about six weeks uh, before there was any improvement, as a matter of fact. But not only did uh, the high school games cancel, uh, but other games were canceled as well. Uh, curiously, back then, there were actually alumni leagues in football. So if you were an alumni of Somerville High School, you could play on an alumni team. And for some reason, they didn't cancel their games. Uh, they went on. But the actual football games were canceled, probably because that's where the major crowds were. College football canceled much of their season. The University of Michigan was the national champion in 1918. Uh, they only uh, played five games, though. They were 5-0. and oh, And for that, they got the national championship. And I think most interestingly, the uh, great pandemic would afflict hockey, the NHL as well. That year, 1918, the favorite to win was Montreal. But unfortunately, on the eve of the Stanley Cup, a little bit later on, all but three of the Montreal team members got sick. So they had to forfeit. And they were playing, drum roll please, the Seattle Metropolitans. So the Seattle Metropolitans, who no longer exist, were about to win the Stanley Cup by forfeit, but they were too honorable to take the Stanley Cup under those circumstances, and they refused the trophy. They wouldn't take it, and as a result, the NHL, until recently, until our own time, was the first league to cancel a championship series owing to an epidemic. And then, by the second week in October, things began to flatten out. A little bit at first, but then noticeably. By October 15th, uh, cases were down significantly. And at that point, Woodward, the health commissioner, and Governor McCall began to think about opening things up. The churches had never officially closed. Many of them closed voluntarily, but no order ever made them close. Businesses were never officially closed unless they were in the classification as amusements. Like I said, theater, saloon, uh, museums, something like that. But most retail outlets stayed open the only thing they tried to do was limit hours of retail outlets. That didn't work so well because that meant you still went to those places, but it was more congested because there were fewer hours for people to go. So they stopped that policy pretty early on. But now it's the middle of October and things look like they were getting better. So at this point, uh, Governor McCall, Woodward and Mayor Peters of Boston joined by Mayor Elridge in uh, Somerville, all decided pretty much at once to open things up. So on October 20th, the schools of Boston opened once more. 
I think they opened at Somerville about the same time. And on October 19th, the day before, which was a Sunday, the saloons, the cafes, the theaters, the movie houses, they all opened at once. And I think Woodward, the health commissioner, who, although he acted way too slowly, did a pretty good job once things actually were closed down. I think Woodward kind of thought people would stay away for a while. Well, they didn't stay away. The saloons were filled on Monday and the theaters, the movie houses were filled on Sunday. And the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts, was filled the first day it opened because a lot of people wanted to see this painting, John Singer Sargent's portrait of John D. Rockefeller. That was on display at the MFA and that's where people went to see it on the day Boston opened up. It was almost as if, for a little while, as if nothing much had happened. The city was back to normal and it was back to normal quickly. I think they were pretty lucky because although the flu never quite went away, uh, it never had another surge after this reopening. It stayed at a pretty low level uh, for about six weeks until there was another spike, uh, not surprisingly because of the armistice celebrations of November 1918. So there was a little bit of a spike after that. And then a third wave, which is beyond the scope of our discussion today, which gripped the world in the winter and spring of 1919. And we think that wave had its major origins in Australia and combined with existing strains to produce a third one, not as bad as the second one, which we've been talking about, but still not so good. So you put all that together and all around the world, at least 50 million people died. The uh, greatest loss of life of any pandemic in world history. And here in the United States, 675,000 people died. 675,000 people died of the great flu epidemic. In Boston, a uh, little over 4,500 died. And in Massachusetts, about 45,000. 45,000 dead if you put all three waves together. But the big culprit is what we were just talking about, and that is the second wave. So finally, uh, things were uh, more or less back to normal, if you can call it that, by the end of 1919. And that's where our story ends. So I hope you were able to hear most of that. I know it could be that my sound went in and out, or maybe your internet or mine went in and out. But if you're all still with me, uh, maybe this would be a good time to stop because it, it's really uh, about time to end because we've almost been going a, a whole hour. Uh, but it could be, if you want to, uh, put a question in the chat room. Uh, I could see just in case there is something here that I can answer. Uh, and maybe if I, anybody wants to unmute themselves or put something in the chat room, I can help you out. But uh, probably we, we'd only be able to take a couple because we're, we're getting late on time. Uh, if some, somebody says, any understanding why the flu ended? Uh, I'm sure there is an understanding why the flu ended, uh, but it seems to have run its course because it spread so far and so wide by the, the summer, especially of 1919, that there, there's probably nothing left much for it to do. Uh, it would come back in different strains, as we know, uh, in decade after decade after that, but nothing nearly so bad, nothing nearly so bad as, as 1918. Uh, were people advised to do social distancing? They were advised to do social distancing. And as a matter of, as a matter of fact, uh, they got strong instructions uh, not to go uh, too near people if they could avoid it. Especially, not surprisingly, don't go near people if they were sick. But my favorite instruction came from a Boston physician who put this in the newspaper. Uh, this guy said, uh, here's what you should do. Uh, do not allow people to cough and sneeze in your face. I thought that's a pretty good idea. Uh, coming from a, a leading Boston doctor. But uh, yeah, uh, there, there was there, a lot of what we do now is, is what they were instructed to do then. Uh, the difficulty was this was a very, very contagious strain. Uh, and the death rate uh, was a bit higher than what we're used to now. Uh, the, the ultimate death rate was about 2.5%. So if you got sick, uh, morbidity was about 2.5% and a little higher if you were in the demographic we talked about, uh, people of military age, measurably higher. Uh, but uh, of course, disastrous uh, because so many people were afflicted with it. We think about one third of the world population came down with the flu. One third of everybody had the flu, had the flu uh, in 1918, 1919. Okay, let's see. Oh, and I, I, before we, we conclude, uh, I did want to say that if uh, anybody is able to uh, access the chat room where there's a link to maybe give to our treasured institution, the Somerville Museum, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, it's uh, on some hard times now, like many institutions are, and uh, 
it would be really nice if maybe we could show our appreciation for all the good work it does by uh, maybe a little something. So I did want to make sure I remember to say that. Uh, did uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence, speaking about somebody in the chat, actually Barbara, uh, did smoking exacerbate people dying from the flu? Uh, I'm not sure that anybody ever measured that at the time, but I can't help but believe it, it must have. Uh, if your lungs are already damaged from smoking, here we have a disease that's attacking the lungs. I, I don't see how that could possibly have helped. Uh, and it probably actually contributed to the mortality rate of the flu in the trenches where just about everybody was smoking in 1918. You would too if we were in the trenches. And that could not have helped what proved to be a really serious mortality rate and sickness rate in the trenches. So if you were in the army, if you were in the US Army, uh, the chances of you getting sick was about 35% uh, in 1918. If you were in the Navy, not surprisingly, you're confined on ships. If you were in the Navy, 40% uh, got sick. Uh, did people protest things being closed? No, uh, not too much. Uh, there was the usual grumbling, but there's a big difference between 1918 and 2020. We've seen protests in 2020, but in 1918, almost everybody thought that this was a time when people were risking their lives in France, you had to sacrifice for the greater good. There was a real sense of sacrifice in 1918. And in fact, people who wouldn't wear masks were called flu slackers or mask slackers. People who weren't patriotic enough to do their clear duty. So the extent to which anybody would protest was, was very much lightened and diminished by the fact that we were already engaged on what people thought of as a great national crusade. Uh, at least you weren't in the trenches. What are you doing protesting about public health measures at home? So you didn't see uh, much of that, if at all. Now, as far as uh, different responses go, Boston, which as we've just seen, acted slowly in this case, Boston was the third hardest hit city in the country. So in terms of morbidity as a percentage of population, Boston was the third worst. Philadelphia uh, was the worst, uh, followed by Pittsburgh and then Boston. But cities that acted very quickly, that had more warning perhaps than Boston did. We were the first place where the flu got in August. But cities that had more warning, they acted more quickly. St. Louis, San Francisco, uh, much less of a problem because they shut things down right away. That wasn't true about Philadelphia. They had that famous Liberty Bonds parade on September 28th, uh, where the, the city pretty much came down with the flu because of that parade. Here in Somerville, uh, we were supposed to have a special event that last week of September. Everybody wanted to raise money for the war. Everybody wanted to buy loans. That was their patriotic duty, buy bonds, that is. And in Somerville, all the election facilities, all the polling places were going to be open on one day for people to go visit, men, women, children, people to go visit to buy bonds. And they hated calling that off, but they did. Uh, they did the right thing. They sacrificed a war measure maybe raising money for public safety. Uh, they didn't like it, but they did. And I think maybe uh, that would be about it. Uh, with the Palmer raids going on at uh, that same time were people dying of this on Deer Island. Uh, on Deer Island, there were deaths, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, my impression is they were mostly military deaths and they were mostly in the fall of 1918. I think civilians at the time, uh, if at all possible, were, were kept at city hospital or the, or the other hospitals around Boston or, or kept at home where too many of them died, as a matter of fact. I think once the military commandeered uh, Long Island, uh, I think uh, that's where a lot of the fatalities occurred. Uh, so, so when I think of the pest house, I'm thinking of Long Island, not Deer Island. Deer Island was, all, was also a place where uh, people were kept uh, and where immigrants were kept, as a matter of fact, uh, some of them awaiting deportation. And I'm not aware of too many of them dying on Deer Island, those who are awaiting deportation, especially after the Palmer raids. But I do know that the flu struck Charles Street Prison with great violence. Uh, it ran rampant through the prison and the death rates there were very high. Uh, but I don't think it was unusually high among people awaiting deportation on Deer Island. Uh, that was a little bit later on. And I think with that, uh, it now being 7.30, I'll, I'll wish you all a good evening. And it was uh, lovely to see you all uh, virtually. I'll, I'll wave at uh, people who I know are in Washington, DC, uh, in uh, uh, Dublin, Ohio, and uh, maybe not Dublin anymore, uh, in, in South Carolina. Uh, 
and also in Berea, Ohio, and uh, in Brooklyn, and in, above all, Somerville. So uh, carry on, everybody, uh, and I hope to see you all in better days. Bye-bye.